afternoon. I'm Andy Linehan, president of the City Club. Welcome to our forum and a celebration of baseball with author and former Major League Baseball player Larry Colton. Before we begin our program, I have the usual items of City Club business. Today we talk about baseball. Next week it's back to the hard stuff. Uh, we're going to be talking about tax reform in Oregon with State Treasurer Randall Edwards, Nike's Global Director of Public Affairs, Paul Kelly, and Oregon, Oregon AFL-CIO President Tim Nesbitt. Uh, Representative Lane Shetterly will also join us briefly to give us an update on uh, the legislative uh, uh, session. So reserve your places online for next Friday, um, either online or uh, directly through the res reservation number at City Club. Then on Saturday, November 1st, we're going to do something a little different. Uh, City Club's new leaders, Council will join with the Blue Monk Restaurant and Jazz Club and the original Cats Jazz Blues Band to celebrate the work of new leaders and the club. This fundraising effort for the club is open to the public with half of all admission proceeds going to City Club. Doors open at 7.30 p.m. and the original Cats will perform from 8 p.m. till midnight. So join us on November 1st to support new leaders, hear great music, and have a great time. Uh, for more details, contact Nikki at the club, and you can RSVP uh, online or uh, in our reservation line. The celebration of the 30th anniversary of the admission of women to City Club has been rescheduled. The new date is Monday, November 24th, and the event will take place on the first floor of, uh, of City Hall from 5.30 to 7. Come here about the picketing, the pig noises, and the plaintiffs that led to the admission of women in City Club. Join Mayor Katz, uh, Gretchen Kafuri, and others as we celebrate with music from 1973 and with great food and drink, including hors d'oeuvres, which are being uh, provided by Voila Catering. Uh, please RSVP to Colin at the, at the City Club office. I have to uh, bring this up each week. We are in our annual fund drive. At this point, we're over halfway to our goal of $115,000 for 2003. We have 257 members and friends who've contributed. Please join them in uh, supporting City Club. There should be contribution envelopes at your tables, um, and please write your check today. Now I'd like to introduce Clyde Doctor, who's chair of the Affordable Housing Advo Advocacy Committee, and he's going to talk to us briefly about an opportunity to turn from research and study into action. Thank you. Uh, I was going to apologize for injecting a note of seriousness in this otherwise lighthearted discussion, and then I realized there's probably a lot of Yankee fans out there who think this is pretty serious business in <laughs> baseball. Uh, I'm here to uh, offer you an opportunity and, and ask for a favor. I'm chair of the uh, City Club's Affordable Housing uh, Advocacy Group. Uh, many of you may not know that the City Club actually does advocate for the recommendations that it makes in its reports. Uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, you adopted a report on affordable housing. Uh, and uh, the report had really two basic uh, uh, findings in it. Uh, the first is that affordable housing is a, what we call a keystone issue. Uh, Low-income people who uh, live in affordable housing uh, perform better at work, uh, they're healthier, uh, their children do better in school. Uh, and you probably saw the report recently uh, that cited the lack of affordable housing as a prime reason for the high hunger rate in Oregon because given the, the choice, low-income people will starve themselves uh, in order to pay the rent. So affordable housing is probably the most efficient way uh, to deal with a lot of social issues. So the bottom line of, of your report uh, was that we need more resources. Uh, well, now is the time for you to again consider that issue because uh, thanks to the good offices of uh, Mayor Katz and, and Commissioner Stan, the City Council is going to begin a process of looking for new resources to support affordable housing, which is exactly what your uh, report urged them to do. Uh, I'm going to uh, ask you for a few things, uh, make some contributions here. Uh, we're going to need about 30 seconds of your time, and most importantly, we want your probably the most important political asset you have, which is your signature. Uh, there's a postcard campaign has been started uh, by Affordable Housing Now, of which the City Club is a member. Uh, these postcards go to the city commissioners, uh, urging them uh, to deal with the affordable housing issue now because it's, it's uh, so critical. Um, all you have to do at the end of the meeting is stop by the table in the corner. There are sets of five of these cards, one for each commissioner. It'll only take you a few seconds to sign your name if you're feeling uh, if you want some extra credit, you can 
put a, a pithy uh, note on the back here. Uh, if you don't, I'll probably do that for you. Uh, I'll, I'll pick them up at the end. Um, I just want to stress how important time is, and then I'll, I'll let you play ball. Um, when we wrote the report, we reported that a, a two-thirds of low-income people who are eligible for affordable housing assistance, two-thirds uh, were not receiving that assistance. Only two years later, that number is now three-fourths. So our, our society is, is uh, proceeding from crisis to tragedy in this area, and I'd really urge you to take those few seconds to sign the cards. Thank you. Thank you, Clyde. I'd like to spend, extend a special welcome to City Club to the students from the Quest School over at our table over here and their teacher, Jeffrey Dakin. Uh, thank you to Lindsay Hart, Neil, and Weigler who uh, sponsored the students attending today, and welcome. We have a new member. <laughs> also like to uh, welcome new member uh, Todd Kimball. Um, there, there he is. Welcome, Todd. broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part by corporate underwriting from Washington Mutual and Portland General Electric, and of course we are very grateful for their support. Uh, finally, I'd just like to remind you all, please turn off your cell phones. Uh, that will keep things our attention on the front podium here. So let's turn to our program. All fans know that baseball is full of ups and downs. This year, Cubs fans who've been waiting 95 years for a World Series championship and Red Sox fans who've been waiting 85 years for the same things both had their hopes ha dashed in a very painful way. For both teams, it happened, it happened when both seemed likely to end up in the World Series. Is Portland ready for this kind of drama? Certainly here in Portland, <laughs> We've had our ups and downs in getting to the point where we are with Major League Baseball. We're looking to Larry Colton to tell us whether we're ready for baseball and how to deal with what uh, Baseball Commissioner Bartlett Giamatti called the heartbreak of baseball. Now, Portlander Larry Colton is the only person to have pitched for the Major Leagues and been nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. He's also taught high school. He's worked for Nike. He's published magazine articles for Esquire, The New York Times, uh, Sports Illustrated, and Ladies Home Journal, among others. Uh, his book, Goat Brothers, was a main selection for the book, uh, book of the Month Club. And then his most recent book, Counting Coup, is a story about women's, a woman's basketball heroine from the Crow Indian Reservation in Montana. And it's uh, won an award at the, uh, as the Frankfurt eBook of the Year. He is also the founder and executive director of three nonprofit programs, the Community of Writers, which is a program to improve writing, instruction, and achievement in local schools, Wordstock, a celebration of books, and Cool School, a summer enrichment program for area students. So welcome, Larry. Thank you. Before I um, sort of talk a little bit about uh, Portland and its attempt to bring Major League Baseball here, I just give a little background on my own baseball, limited career such as it was. When I was a rookie coming up, I had this coach, and being a rookie, I was kind of intimidated, and this coach, he would always go, hey, Red, get over here. Hey, Red, what's happening today? Hey, Red, go warm up. I kept going, Red? Why are you calling me Red? But I wouldn't tell him because I was a little bit nervous. So finally, I got up the nerve to go up to him. I said, Coach, why you call me Red? And he said, because you look like one of them guys who read a book. <laughs> <laughs> but um, since getting out of baseball, um, I have been uh, a teacher and a writer. And, but weirdly enough, over the years, and it's been a long time since I played, I still get um, requests in the mail for a bubble, for to sign my bubble gum card. <laughs> Actually, when I sign it, the value goes down. But the, uh, I did just cross the $2 threshold, you know, so I'm moving up, you know. <laughs> you know. And there was a time when I went in and, and couldn't even afford to buy my own card. But the, uh, but when I get these letters from all over the country uh, requesting me to sign the card and send them back, I always do this thing, or I started doing it a couple of years ago when Counting Coup, my latest book, came out. And part of the marketing thing, they made this postcard from, of the book. And so what I always do is I take this and I write, read this book 
on, he on here. Then I take the card and I fold them together and then I mail them back in the self-addressed envelope. And I've probably done that close to a thousand times and out of a thousand times, not once <laughs> have I ever heard back from any fan saying, oh, I loved your book. <laughs> Which, so I'm not sure that, again, it goes back to the ba baseball and red situation. So, um, but I, I'd like to, uh, from another uh, book that I wrote, I'd like to read a couple of things about my connection to baseball, that, uh, to use it to preface my remarks about big league baseball here in Portland. It's from a book called Goat Brothers. Dad never missed a game and always found a way to take off work to come see me play. He never criticized or yelled or acted the little league father fool. I wanted so badly to do well in front of him. As a boy, I waited in the driveway for him to come home from work. Ball and glove in hand, barely giving him a chance to get out of the car. He'd lay his coat across the fender of his 53 Pontiac, roll up his sleeves of his white shirt, and start tossing a scuffed up baseball back and forth. Not much talk. Or better yet, he'd take me to the diamond at nearby Loyola University in Los Angeles and hit me grounders at shortstop, sending me deep into the hole for the backhand or have me charge a slow uh, chopper. He decided when it was time to quit. On the way home, I noticed the blisters on his hands. Baseball, I suppose, was the sure way for him to let me know I was a boy as well as his boy. He loved the sport. It wasn't complicated. It was a world whose rules we could grasp. Sex, religion, the Korean War, McCarthyism, death, those were beyond us, too complicated to discuss. He had played some ball, ball at Venice High, but he never talked much about it, the details of it. He was a generation of fathers who, who lived by the motto uh, of never flailing their sons with the tales of their austerior youth. Then when I went to the University of California, baseball was my ticket to self-confidence. I was intimidated in the classroom, never joining in class discussions. With girls, I felt insecure, afraid of getting shot down, no clue what they were thinking, although Lipker was beginning to help. But as soon as I put on my jock, I felt fixed in my place in the world. It was as, as if I had decided in an early age, or maybe it was decided for me, that baseball but would be the one thing in my life that would best define me. It was something I could do better than others, giving me a distinct identity. I had devoted an an estimable amount of hours throwing a rubber ball against the side of the garage as a boy, al allowing baseball to not only define my life, but to design it. It allowed me to walk on campus quietly knowing that if I flunked every class, I still had pro baseball as my whole card. In my dismal freshman year, after I flunked my sociology midterm, and the TA told me that I didn't get the concept, my first impulse was tell him to tune in the World Series in a few years and then tell me who didn't get the concept. <laughs> well, as luck would have it, I was able to uh, make the major leagues after three years in the minor leagues, of which I played here against the Portland Beavers. And so this little excerpt here is about my major league debut and was on May 6, 1968 on a chilly evening at Crosley Field in Cincinnati. Colton, warm up, you're going in next inning. That was the pitcher. The words took the chill right out of the evening. It was too late to learn a new curve. <laughs> every muscle and every fiber in my body was in fourth gear before I even lifted my butt off the bench. This was it my major league debut, the precise moment that I had been working for my whole life, my father's whole life. I was about to dance the essential moment to play with the powerful icons of my American dream. 
for me to be emotionally in control at a time of such dramatic personal intensity would have been, uh, would have been to will away a tornado. Tornado. I rushed through my eight warm-up pitches. As the first batter made his way to the plate, I tor turned toward the outfield and rubbed up the baseball. The view before me locked forever in my senses. The grassy terrace in left field, the Wiedemann's billboard, the long, long jeans clock atop the scoreboard, the house lights twinkling on a nearby hillside. A voice from the press box high above the plate announced my name, then the batter. Now batting for Cincinnati, number 14, right fielder, Pete Rose. <laughs> <laughs> I needed more than a new curveball, let me tell you that right now. <laughs> yeah, Pete Rose, ex-rookie of the year, Charlie Hustle. I watched him dig in, taking his familiar crouch stance in his sleeveless uniform, bent at the waist, waving his bat. He was hitless in this game, trying to keep a 20-game hitting streak alive. My catcher, Mike Ryan from New Hampshire squatted behind the plate and signaled for a fastball. As I nodded in agreement, every mechanic of pitching that had ever been taught was forgotten. <laughs> My mind was blank. Ryan's target, a distant beacon, the, plain, the plate, a postage stamp. I rocked into my windup and let it fire, the ball heading toward the plate as if on a leisurely stroll. <laughs> Rose leaned into the plate, then watched contemptuously as the ball sailed low and away. Umpire Harry Windelstadt signaled ball one. Ryan put down two curve, two fingers, curve ball. Gripping the ball behind my back, I had more confidence in my ability at that instant to recite the complete works of Camus. <laughs> If my infielders were chattering up behind me, I didn't hear them. The pitch bounced two feet in front of the plate. <laughs> Rose snarled. He wanted to swing the bat to, and keep his hitting streak alive. Ryan walked halfway to the mound, offering words of encouragement. Eye on the target, he said, settling in behind the plate, signaling another fastball. The last thing I wanted to do was walk my first major league hitter I faced, so that in so with that in mind, I went into my delivery and hummed an overhand express right down Broadway. And to find out what happened, you got to read the, buy the damn book. <laughs> it's, a, it's not about literature, it's about marketing. As fate would have it, Weirdly enough, that was the only game I ever played in. About a week later, we went to San Francisco. I was in the wrong place at the wrong time in a barroom ball brawl, and just the wrong person, and I didn't instigate it, because um, I went to Berkeley. I was in peace, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so uh, that was the end of my big league career. One game. Other than one person in this room, however, that makes me have played one more game than any of you. <laughs> and a friend of mine, uh, Keith Overman, former uh, host of uh, Sports Center, said, Larry, it's the jump from zero to one that's the toughest. <laughs> so um, when I played in the major leagues, that, it was a Tuesday, by the way. The <laughs> <laughs> My salary was $8,000 a year. This year, Alex Rodriguez made three times that much per inning. Yet they want to go out on strike. OK. Um, but now to the idea of bringing Major League Baseball here to, to Portland. And what I'm uh, about to say uh, might run contrary to, to my love of the game and my background and what some people in town might want. 
And I don't want to be seen as the Grinch who was against baseball, Major League Baseball here in Portland. But I have reservations about the feasibility of Major League Baseball here in Portland. And some of these are from a gut level, from a passion, and some of them are from a little bit of research that I've done. So I would just like to briefly touch on, on four or five issues here about the, the concept of bringing Major League Baseball to Portland. One would be the economics of it. One, two would be about the quality of life here. Three, Portland as a baseball city. Four, the overall health of Major League Baseball. Five, PG Park. And then finally, is this a good priority for the city? First, I'll start with quality of life. I know I've read articles and seen uh, and heard people talk about that we're a minor league team, a minor league town, until we get a major league baseball team. So there's sort of this inferiority complex that seems to exist if we don't have a major league baseball team. It's also been said that a major league baseball team will revolutionize the city on a cultural level in ways that people don't understand. But I submit that we are a major league city. This is, I've lived here for 30 years. It's the best city I've been to. I love this place. And with or without a major league ball team, we don't need a major league ball uh, club here to be a major league town. We, are, we already have accomplished that. And, and quality of life is about air quality. It's about traffic. It's about schools. It's about recreational opportunities. It's about jobs. It's about community safety. And so for us to be a major league uh, city, I don't think that's an argument. I think we already are. Next is about Portland as a baseball community. Um, and whether we have the, the, the passion for the sport here to make baseball viable. And here, uh, I probably disagree with some people, but I don't, think base, I, I don't think Portland is necessarily a good baseball city. It's not in the fabric of the community like it's in Chicago or Boston or LA or Philadelphia. It, it just is not ingrained in that. Go buy parks today. You don't see kids out playing ball. I just was out in towards Beaverton and I went by a skate park out there. There was 50 kids out there by a skate park. You can go by any ball field today and they're deserted. We've had trouble supporting the Portland Beavers over the years. Um, why are we gonna make the leap to support Major League Baseball when we, we've barely been able to support the uh, Portland Beavers? Last night, I took my six-year-old grandson to dinner at Red Robins, which to me is about as close to an assignment from hell as you can get. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I don't like Red Robins, it's the video games and all this stuff. But anyway, I sat close to the, the, the bar uh, because I, the game, I wanted to watch the game. Game five of the World Series. I still watch baseball, I love baseball. Here's game five, on in there. there it's not on, there's 15 people in there no, and there's five televisions in the bar and they're all turned to the O'Reilly factor. <laughs> I nearly threw up my whiskey burger. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, so I think in some degree, we're, the people that we're recruiting Major League Baseball with our hearts more than our common sense. The other thing is, is we're up, our main competition is Washington, D.C. Now realistically, what chance do we have against Washington, D.C.? I've read papers in New York and Boston and Chicago and other places and they talk about you know, where are they gonna locate the expos and in most of those stories, they don't even mention Portland. They mention D.C. back there. And, the, and they have the senators and the political and the, the uh, force and that's where I think that the baseball owners wanna locate. Next is just the health of Major League Baseball, the health of the sport. And the best thing that's happened to the sport recently are these incredible playoffs and the surge in, in uh, interest that there was when Chicago and Boston were going for that. But baseball is still plagued with labor problems. They just dodged a runaway train in signing a labor agreement last year. 
There's the continued domination of high revenue teams, i.e. the New York Yankees. In most major league towns, attendance is down, not up. Also, tickets are escalating. The price of tickets are escalating everywhere. Also, a lot of it is because of player salaries. From 1990 to the year 2000, players' salaries went up 243%. 243%. Also, the core base of baseball fans is aging. They have not done a good enough job of attracting younger fans. And that is a major problem. Also, baseball is run by a self-selecting group of owners that have no oversight and with their own hand-picked commissioner. I was about to add another word there, but I didn't. <laughs> it's a private business. We don't, we're, we don't get to see the books. They can manipulate their, their, their uh, bottom line by complex uh, intercompany transactions. They will write it out, they'll put it, they might be owned by a cable company and it goes into the, the, the revenue goes into there. And yet, even though they cry that they're losing money, the owners aren't losing money, personally. Also, baseball forever has been under the antitrust exemption. It just recently came up again, and it was renewed, the antitrust exemption, which gives it a monopoly status. And they say that it is an entertainment business. It's, it's an entertainment rather than a business. Yet every baseball player will tell you, or they'll be quoted it and saying when they're negotiating their salary, this is a business. I have to look out after my family. But this monopoly allows for such things as the $8 hot dog. PG Park. If we bring a baseball team here, they're going to have to play at least two years in PG Park. I played here in 1967 when the dressing rooms were right downstairs, in, in right here in the, the Mac Club. Lou Pinella once took me deep here, right out of the ballpark here. But my fear is, is that the players come here, the players would hate this park, in my belief, except that they'd love it because they could hit a lot of home runs here. But um, with that turf out there, I don't inflict that on the players. That's dangerous, that turf they have. It's better than it was. The other thing about PG Park, and I think we learned something in the recent World Cup, Women's World Cup that was here, they can't, they are not yet able to handle large crowds. They, the the uh, uh, concession stands are, you can barely get to them, the traffic is a mess, all sorts of things. So I, f I fear what would happen if that was here. But perhaps more than anything, the reason that the, the common sense doesn't work with bringing Major League Baseball to uh, Portland is the economics of the whole deal. Um, Study after study by independent and impartial um, uh, groups uh, of economists have concluded that there's no basis whatsoever for forecasting that a building a new stadium or bringing a major league of sports franchise to a team will make an economic impact on a com community. Unfortunately, t cities that, that are, are wanting this, they hire hack economists to go out and, and support their, uh, their um, concept. But every study that has, impartial study that has been done that shows that it doesn't work. It doesn't bring new money to the, the community. The library of journal, the library journal um, took these, listed some of these um, studies and said that they should be required reading for every mayor and city official considering building a new stadium in their community. But I, I fear that those uh, studies have been ignored here in the passion and the desire to bring a, a, a ball club here. Um, because it's a lot more than a case of build it and they will come. They claim they'll create new jobs. 
1,500 uh, construction jobs, 2,000 uh, permanent jobs. That's in the, the, the literature of the major league uh, people. I, I, I question where are 2,000 job, permanent jobs going to come from from a major league uh, baseball team? You got 25 players, a few um, executives, and the rest are not all of them, but most of them are parking attendants. They're going to be hot dog salesmen. Those are entry level jobs, minimum wage jobs. They're part time. Um, I don't think that it creates 2,000 permanent jobs. They say that it stimulates the economy. Well, every study has shown that it doesn't stimulate the economy, it just redistributes the economy. And for instance, if if somebody in Clark County wants to come over to a ball game, then they won't go to a movie in a restaurant in Clark C County, and they will take that money and they'll bring it over here, but that takes away money from the suburbs. Same thing with Beaverton or Gresham, is that there's the entertainment dollar, and it will go here, and it'll be taken away from somewhere else, and it's really just a case of beggar thy neighbor. There's no ripple effect. Well, the baseball people were able to pass House Bill 3606, which brought a $150 million bond that is going to be paid for by players' salaries, and that is to fi help finance the stadium. But by their own um, uh, uh, figures, a new stadium is going to cost between $300 and $350 million. So that leaves them considerably short. So where's that other money going to come from? Well, they say that it's going to come from $60 million, $60 million uh, all these are bonds, $60 million from ticket tax on, on uh, uh, sales. So that's just escalating the ticket prices by putting a tax on the tickets. $25 million is going to come from charging a tax on the premium seats, not the skyboxes, but the best seats. They're going to they're gonna tax those seats. $70 million is going to come from hotel and restaurant, and $25 million is from a tax increment uh, financing. And if you add those up, that comes to $330 million to, to finance, and because that's no shifting of any funds from existing um, budget funds. That's $330 million, but Safeco Field cost $520 million. And we would want a state-of-the-art thing here. So the struggle is going to be tough to, to make that work financially. So it comes down to a case of priorities, in my opinion, is how do we use the city's energy? Now let's assume that no money is ex ex shifted from existing revenues, which is what they say. And I, I, I believe them. And they've said that no, two, no new taxes will be levied. At this time in Portland and Oregon, is this the best focus for our community? Bringing Major League Baseball to Portland is a, a feel-good cause. It's glamorous. It gains us national recognition. It's the pure joy of having a home team to root for a wonderful and, in most cases, whole, wholesome form of entertainment. We should all have the passion that, that the people in Chicago and Boston have for those teams. But it seems to me there's a time, there was a time when it was easier to rally the political and business communities around things of greater importance. And we are facing just such an issue right now, and that's our schools and our state's educational system. What if we use these same tactics, the resources and the energies, and persuasive lobbying powers to sell programs that keep kids in school, to improve writing achievement, to bring art and music back into the classroom? What kind of economic impact would that make? Think of the dollar impact if we kept all our youngsters in school and off drugs and encouraged, cajoled, and taught them to be socially and economically responsible. I believe the long-term impact of that would be far greater than some banjo-hitting shortstop on a cellar-dwelling team or even a 60-home run slugger on a pennant winner. We've done a great job in paying lip service 
of the importance of education, but how many folks in the community have been to a school board meeting lately, or talked with their local principal, or visited a classroom, or volunteered in a student mentoring program? Part of the problem, and a big part of the problem, are the schools themselves. Not the teachers, not the principals, not the students, but the district administrations. They have done a dog poor job in reaching out to embrace the community. Too often they have asked for community input and then completely ignored the advice they got. I deal with this on a daily basis, especially in Portland. Our schools are in crisis. Now that's not a news scoop. The problem isn't the teachers or, the, or that the kids aren't smart enough, as smart as they used to be. I work with teachers every day and every day I'm blown away by their passion, their dedication, and their commitment. I can't think of a more important job. I'm in awe of these people. I'm also in awe of Roger Clemens, or as Sammy, I'm not on steroids Sosa. <laughs> I can only dream of being so gifted, so rich. I wish from the bottom of my heart that I had a split finger fastball that fell off the table. But I don't. But what I do have is some experience in the schools and how to improve um, writing achievement. In the last four years, I've been able to raise $1.5 million for community writers, and that money has come from a lot of people in this community, a Meyer Memorial Trust, the Snitzers. Uh, just last week, Tim Boyle of Columbia Sportswear gave me $190,000 for my programs. I mean, the generosity can sometimes be just, it's, it's amazing. But it's still not enough. So what might people do? Well, several things. They can go talk to their legislators. I doubt that that will do much good. But I just wish we had the same sense of urgency in our schools that we do for Major League Baseball. Recently, I gave a speech that, and I was asked what would I do if I was superintendent. And I answered by saying that's a mute question because I'd never, I'd never pass the background check. <laughs> But I, what I really ne believe needs to happen is more of an entrepreneurial approach to education. It, is, it appears to me that the, the lame brains in Salem are never gonna give the schools what they need. So it's up to the business community to provide the leadership. I don't think it's coming from the schools themselves. So what can you do here maybe? and that's as if you don't want to just run me out of town for being a wet blanket on Major League Baseball. I have a shorter uh, um, uh, micro idea. You can donate to Community of Writers, a program that works either by direct tax deductible contribution or by purchasing a, a, a book, a counting coup. I don't know, Borders never showed up. Borders was supposed to be here to sell the book and all the money from the pro, uh, that sale of my book was gonna go to my uh, program here, but Borders never showed up. Oh, they are, all right. Borders has been a big uh, contributor to the programs. Here's another way. To volunteer as a mentor in our program. We, I'll have a sign-up sheet where you can come up. It would be one hour a month, and the impact it would have on kids is enormous. Um, it just sitting down with a kid and reading something that they have written. What the kids write today is amazing. So much of it comes from the heart, and so much of it tells about who they are, where they are, what they're doing. But in a classroom of 30, 35, the teachers can't even, they don't even have time to read this. There needs to be more help. If we could get, much like the SMART program, if we could get people in, in this program into the classroom, we put writers in the school, we buy books and we do all that, but we need uh, help from the community. And if we could get that today from you and two people from your work, I'm sure we can make a huge difference in the lives of these kids in the classroom. So 
I appreciate the opportunity to speak in from with you here today. And um, did I mention that my book is in sale out there in the lobby? <laughs> I should point out, every time I go speak somewhere, I always figure, well, I, I got more major league experience than anybody here, but today I don't. There's a gentleman here, I don't know where he's sitting, Pete Ward. Pete Ward is one of the great players that ever come out of this town. Played 15 years in the big leagues or some damn amount. Like, where is Pete? There he is back there. <laughs> Pete was on the all-star team. Did you get $25 million a year, Pete? Close. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Larry. It might seem a bit of a curveball. We uh, started with baseball and ended up with schools, but maybe we needed to hear that. Um, as you all know, City Club members have the uh, privilege of pitching questions at our speakers, and our first pitcher today is Nikki Lynch. Uh, she's a board member. She was former chair of the research board and currently chair of the program committee, and she's also a vice president and senior financial consultor, consultant at Merrill Lynch. Uh, following Nikki's question, of course, we'll take questions from the floor. Please limit your questions to 30 seconds and identify yourself as a City Club member. Thanks. Well, this may be sort of an obvious question, but I think you're in a, in a really perfect place to answer this. And, and given you know, your talk about the schools and, and needing more help with writing in the schools, maybe you could tell us what you also think of how important sports are in school, you know, having obviously that been a big important thing to you? I think uh, the value of sports can't be underestimated. It, as I'm uh, in that little piece that I read, it designed who I was, it gave me self-confidence. I think the best thing to happen in, in the public schools in the last 30 years has been Title IX, which has allowed women to get into sports, and you see the confidence that it builds within. <laughs> I know Portland has gone through some real problems trying to fund their teams, as every community has, where they have bake sales or whatever the heck they do to keep them going. But if they, I mean, eliminating um, sports is not the, the uh, uh, solution. It's part of the problem. So I, I'm all for sports. My, uh, my grandson just signed up for T-ball uh, the other day, and, and I took him in there, and he, he goes, I'm not playing T-ball. I'm ready for the big leaps. <laughs> <laughs> Cy Cornfield, City Club member. I uh, grew up in New York when the Dodgers and Giants were both there and followed the Giants out to San Francisco and <laughs> ended up in LA and then here. But, and I agree with quite a bit of what you said. However, I'm also a member of the board of the Multnomah Education Service District. And I have a problem with what you have said, the, board, the boards set policy, do not run detailed, do not run schools. And I, I'm also a member of Oregon School Board Association as a result. And I think that most of the, almost all of the school boards here and the school, and schools try to do it. We are f strapped for money. And that is one of the big issues in I don't know what you do to overcome that, but I don't think a blame game plays very much, plays well. Um, I'll, I'll make a question out of that is, how do I think that the Portland School Board has done in the last five years? I think it has been terrible. I, I think the lack of superintendent, the lack of leadership in the Portland School District has been, not from the, the people don't care, but they have not been able to come up with a realistic plan and implement that plan. And part of the problem, of course, is funding. You can come up with all sorts of great plans if you don't have the, the funding. It's good. But there, there's well-intentioned people, certainly, at every level of this. But my, I deal with administrators, and um, I always think I, I, they're very frustrating. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Coleman. Um, Arnold Kogan, member of the City Club. I'm disturbed or at least confused by the, uh, the logic that you uh, use to come to the conclusion that Portland is not a baseball, major league baseball town. I mean, after all, New York, Chicago, Boston, other cities that you mentioned, um, there is a passion for baseball because they have major league baseball. And 
I'm thinking of Portland before the Trailblazers came here. Would you have said then that Portland is not a major league basketball town? Or before the Mariners came to Seattle, would you say, well, Seattle's not a major league uh, baseball town? So what do you base your conclusions other than that you saw Mr. O'Reilly O'Reilly on, right. uh, on, on television during the major league uh, during the World Series? Do you have some real uh, evidence or uh, No, I don't have real as evidence other than living in this city uh, for 30 years and talking to people <laughs> and just, and I've lived in other cities, Chicago, Philadelphia, LA, San Francisco, and just, uh, it's a sense, it's a gut level feeling and, and it's not based on any empirical evidence. It's just the feeling that I, I don't think that there is the fan um, support for baseball here. And you make a good point about the Blazers this wasn't a basketball town before the Blazers got here, and hopefully Major League Baseball could could gain the same foothold that the Blazers did and turn it around like that. There has been evidence in the last uh, couple of years, the television ratings for the uh, this playoff series that just happened and for the World Series last year, the television ratings in Portland were higher than the national average. So there's, and in some ways, well, the t television statistics don't lie. And so that might be more empirical evidence than my, you know, walking around the city and talking to people, but, but um, uh, it's just a gut level feeling. But there is some evidence that it would draw from the, if you base it on television, uh, yes. Okay, I have a, my name is Mark Allen, uh, City Club member. I have a quick comment and a question. The comment is that during college, as a student organizer for a gay and lesbian student club, I was both verbally and physically uh, attacked by members of the school's what I call quasi-professional sports team, both baseball and football, so I'd rather not see my tax dollars support that kind of people. The question I have is that it bothers me to here you say that one of the proposals is, quote, and I quote from you, I hope I'm right, is a hotel and restaurant tax. Now, this city is, one of the reasons I came here is that there is no restaurant tax in the city. Now, are they proposing a tax for any meal out to pay for that stadium? If they are, I hope darn well that all of the restaurant operators are aware of that and should fight that appropriately. Thank you. Yeah, um, is there a, uh, the hotel restaurant tax thing? I, I don't profess to be a, um, an expert on that. I, w I met yesterday with David Kahn, who is the leading the Oregon coalition, for a stadium coalition, to bring a team here. And he was the one who outlined to me that w uh, where the money was gonna come from in addition to the $150 million bond they already have. And he mentioned that, and I used that in my thing. But um, I, I, I think it is more of a tax on the restaurants and the, the um, uh, hotels rather than the uh, people who go there, but then it's just gonna be passed along to them. I, I see that, that those things would go up. That would be my guess, but I'm not an expert on that. Yes. I'm Oliver Massengale, City Club member. Uh, thank you, Mr. Colton. I found your remarks very informative and enjoyable, probably because I agree with most of what you have to say. Um, <laughs> I live, in, I live in what may be the only home in the country that doesn't have a television set, but one big advantage of this deficiency is that I get to read a lot of books. I read Goat Brothers years ago, enjoyed it enormously. I was on the waiting list at Borders for Counting Coup when I first heard, out that, heard that you'd come out with another book. They called me the day they received this first shipment, and I was not disappointed. It was an excellent read. I want to assure you, you stop that right there. <laughs> We need a question. Yeah. I want to assure you that when and if you write another book, you can be certain of at least one sale. Here oh, well, I uh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I'm currently nine months overdue on my next book. It's because I've spent so much time working with the schools um, to the detriment of my writing career, but hopefully to the impact of what's going on in the classroom. Uh, Guinevere Milius, club member. Um, I'm going to find a way to tie two tenuously related questions together, and I apologize. Well, I just tied a whole there. bunch of tenuous <laughs> related things together. Um, first of all, I want to say I'm a Seattle Mariners fan, and I'm content to cheer for my team from down here. Um, I, I agree with you that Portland doesn't need a team. Um, secondly, I, I, I'm, I think that a lot of what happened in New York and Boston had to do with baseball starting there in a more innocent time. 
and, mm -hmm. and I think that probably one of the reasons that uh, it's harder to get a major league team going now is because of this loss of innocence, the ticket prices, the baseball strike, salaries as they are, uh, I think it makes it uh, makes people feel more cynical about baseball in a cyclical way. Um, so what I wanted to know is if you, if you can talk at all about this, about how much more expensive it's gotten on a on a percentage scale to go to a to a baseball game these days, and compared to say 1950, how much did it cost in real dollars to go to a game as opposed to now? Do you know any of those statistics? And and then can you talk about whether baseball should become a smaller game in that way? Should should baseball lose its prominence prominence as a national sport in order to preserve its health? And would women coming back into baseball since their time in World War II when they got to play professional baseball, would starting a women's league like we've seen in soccer and in basketball help the health of baseball for the entire society? That's an interesting question. Um, whether they have brought back, I would like to see them bring back um, or have allow women to go into professional sports. It might make me reconsider a comeback on my own, but the, the <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but the um, uh, golly, there was some questions in there. Uh, should uh, baseball uh, shrink down? Uh, possibly in a way. One thing that I can talk about is in minor league baseball, um, and this is one of my objections to PG Park here, is I played a few years in the minor leagues and I've gone to some minor league games and, and the beauty of minor league baseball is the intimacy of the setting. It is the closeness between the players and the, f and the fans and, their, and the billboards and, their, and it's just, um, and this is not an intimate setting here. You, the th from third base to f uh, um, uh, uh, fans to the third base line is a bigger distance than in any major league ballpark. It's like, a, it's like acres out there and you're set in an, uh, behind I would have rather have seen them build here or rebuild, configure a 10,000 seat stadium. How many times do the Beavers draw over 10,000 fans? And you go to those in, in Billings, Montana or Macon or even Eugene, which has a ratty old ballpark, but it's really cute and humble and all of that. And it's just a nice feeling. You don't get that here. You're not in touch. How, name me one member of the Portland Beavers last year. Give me a name. Yeah, that was two years ago. <laughs> but nice try. <laughs> so, I don't know, maybe they sent him down for some rehabilitation thing. I might be wrong about that. But at any rate, um, no, baseball, baseball um, is battling for its place in the American uh, sports um, uh, thing and has been uh, the NFL and uh, NBA has sort of passed it by in some ways. And, but baseball should rely on, on uh, what's always been, just the sport itself. Yes. Pat Rumor, City Club member. And I think it's very clear, Larry, that you have a real passion for baseball as well as for education. And I was struck by the, uh, the note you made about the fact that baseball basically isn't attracting a lot of younger, I don't know, players or younger people who want to go to the game. And I wondered if you've thought or tried in any way to kind of bring those two passions together in terms of how do you really go back to the grassroots and develop a strong love of the sport, participation in baseball, both men and women at their young adult stage, and maybe link that to writing. I don't know. I mean, I'm just thinking of those passions and how do you rebuild the grassroots if you're really going to have a, a healthy sport over a long period of time? Well, my first um, step in rebuilding uh, the passion for baseball at the youth level was would be to ban soccer. <laughs> <laughs> They bring that raggedy ass sport in here and run around, you know. Oh, it's nail to nail. Ooh, you know. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. That's one solution. Um, um, I, I, I would just. Um, I don't know how you rekindle enthusiasm. When I played in high school. Um, it was like you didn't think about growing up to be a pro basketball player or a pro football player. It was you're going to be a pro ball player, and then I don't think kids today think of that. There's too many options, and the, and the money is so good, and and uh, uh, I don't know how I would combine my writing into that unless I, I, you know, if I wrote an article about it, nobody would read it. So, so 
There you go. Yes. Hi, uh, Gil Johnson, City Club member, diehard Cubs fan, and uh, uh, Russell Baker traces the decline in knowledge of geography among adolescent boys to uh, the advent of Playboy, thus rendering National Geographic, um, you know, where the only other place you could, back in the 50s, you could watch see Okay, I get, the core, I get the connection. You know, uh, All right. They were, you know, so, and I know among my kids who are 10 and 13 that they have real trouble with fractions now. I never did because I had baseball cards and I figured my own batting average out as well as everybody else and everything else and what my batting average would have been if I actually got a hit. And yeah. So, what I'm, I'm just kind of following up the other, with the last question. Um, seems to me that, literature I've read, the only good writing about sports is in about either baseball or boxing. And boxing is pretty much dead right now anyway, so we still have baseball. You're dealing with kids. Do they have passions? And are there other things, other sports, evidently not soccer, that uh, we're going to find some good literature out of uh, down the road? Well, um, Baseball has always, you know, the literature of baseball and the people who write about baseball, it's always been, there's some incredible writing that's done about it. The people have always said, I, I've never written a book about baseball. I've included in a few things, but I've sort of avoided that. And I think part of the, my own personal thing with that was that I was an athlete. And then when I went into writing, I wanted to be a writer and I didn't want to write about sports so much. And so, um, the, even though I still do to some extent, but, um, um, and speaking of boxing, probably the best writer of boxing in the United States lives right here in Portland. Her name is Catherine Dunn. She's an incredible writer. She wrote a book called Geek Love. She just she's, she knows boxing as well as anybody. Uh, she's been she's working on a book called Cut Man right now, a book about boxing. And uh, I told you I was nine months overdue. She's got me beat ten times that much, so so I've. <laughs> feel good about that, but the, yeah, I feel good about her misery, you know, but um, uh, I, I just wish there was some way, when I go into the, to the schools, and I, I don't find kids talking about it all, they don't, they're not following it, I, I tried to get my grandson to watch the, the playoff game, and pff, he wanted to watch Spongebob, <laughs> guess what we watched, <laughs> Spongebob, all right, I think we have time for one more question, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, I just wanted to make two quick points and then a question. Sure. One was that I uh, lived in Eugene for a few years, and the reason why people went to the stadium in Eugene to go to the M's games was that they had dollar beers. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and um, <laughs> So there's your answer. That's how to start yeah, bringing yeah. people back. And anybody who's gone to PG and Park and on yeah. Thursday yeah. nights when the Beavers yeah. play, no, yeah. that's the other reason why yeah. that's the big attendance yeah. night. Um, well, I guess uh, my question would be, um, I know that uh, in the past few years, baseball has started to attract people from uh, a wider range of countries. We have mm -hmm. players from Japan now and everything. So um, do you think that uh, the talent pool these days, do you think the product that Major League Baseball is selling is as good now as it was in, say, the 1960s with, you know, they're able to bring in more players from overseas, so they have better players in that sense, but they also have more teams. That's a good, very good uh, question. The, the, if you go to football or, or basketball, the difference between football and basketball today as compared to 1960, there is no comparison. A football team or a basketball team would slaughter one of those old teams, the Boston Celtics or whoever it was, because they're just so, you know, who's going to guard these guys that are, so, they're just, um, so much larger. In baseball, I think, however, that the talent has remained fairly consistent over the years. I think the hitters are stronger, and I hate to say it, a lot of that has to do with steroids, but the, the, um, the hitters are stronger and they're faster, and yes, they're drawing more from the Dominican or Puerto Rico or wherever they are. The one constant in baseball that makes it pretty much the same as it was um, 30 years ago or 70 years ago is pitching, is that Pitchers today don't throw any harder than when I played or, or when um, Babe Ruth played. You, it, it, the human arm is only built to throw the ball so hard. The difference, the improvement in pitching today is in the split finger fastball. That's the only difference. But the, the bigger uh, uh, issue in Major League Baseball player today uh, about the quality of play is that when I played, there were 16 teams in the Major Leagues. Th now there's 30. 
So that's 14 more teams, even though I wasn't a math major, I can, I can figure some things out. F 14 more teams. F well, just take pitchers alone. Each team carries 10 pitchers. So that's 140 pitchers that are in the major leagues now that weren't there 30 years ago. Those, it's like essentially, they just moved up the AAA team into the major leagues. It's diluted the talent level, especially at the pitching level, because they're just not any better than they used to be. And so that means there's more mediocre pitchers out there that these incredible hitters are facing. I think that's, that would be what I would consider the biggest difference. And back then, also, dollar beer night would have been considered a ripoff. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Larry, for your comments about the heart of baseball and the heart of Portland. We're adjourned.